Thank you for joining us tonight. We are currently playing our pre-event slideshow. Gold text on a white background. Live from NYPL logo. Live from NYPL presents the Harry Belafonte Black Liberation Speaker Series with thanks to Kenneth Cole, Raven Leilani and Kylie Reed with Roxanne Fikir. November 16th, 2020, 8 p.m. EST. This slide contains images of the two featured book jackets. The first book jacket features a close-up image of a dark-skinned figure in profile. All that is visible is the nape of their neck, crowned by black curls. There is a light leak color effect with red, yellow, and blue tones saturating the image. The text reads, Luster, a novel, Raven Leilani. The second book jacket features a dense array of various blue shapes and forms painted on a black background, including a key, a goldfish, and an airplane. In a pink handwriting style font, New York Times bestseller, Such a Fun Age, a novel, Kylie Reed. Black text on a white background. Books by tonight's speakers are available for purchase online from the library shop, nypl.org shop. Proceeds benefit the New York Public Library. Plus, receive a free commemorative 125th anniversary tote bag with your purchase. This slide contains the same images of the two featured book jackets with the Simply E logo. Black text on a white background. Reserve copies of Luster and Such a Fun Age for free with a New York Public Library card. Available through Simply E on iOS and Android nypl.org slash simply e. This slide contains the same images of the two featured book jackets. Black text on a white background. These titles and more are available in accessible formats for community members who do not use standard print. Find out more at nypl.org slash talking books. Black text on a white background. Recommended reading. Raven Leilani suggests these titles for further reading. The New Me by Hallie Butler. Bestiary by Kei Ming Chang. Outline by Rachel Cusk. Here is the Sweet Hand by Francine J. Harris. Finna by Nate Marshall. On Beauty by Zadie Smith. Check out the complete list on tonight's event page at nypl.org slash live. Black text on a white background. More recommended reading. Kylie Reed suggests these titles for further reading. Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin. Lucy by Jamaica Kincaid. Special Topics in Calamity Physics by Marisha Pessel. The Perfect Nanny by Leila Slimani. The Little Friend by Donna Tartt. Find these and other great reads in NYPL's collections, browse.nypl.org. Contactless checkout is available at more than 50 grab-and-go locations, nypl.org slash grab-and-go. Accessible formats are available through nypl.org slash talking books. Black text on a white background. Live from NYPL presents the Harry Belafonte Black Liberation Speaker Series with thanks to Kenneth Cole. Brian Washington with Vincent Cunningham. Wednesday, December 2nd at 8 p.m. EST. The winner of the library's 2020 Young Lions Fiction Award discusses the tale of love, vulnerability, alienation, family, and separation at the heart of his first novel, Memorial. For more information and to register, visit nypl.org slash live. Well, we have to look to ourselves because I think the last frontier of truth and hope you. in this country is the people themselves. Somewhere in this moment, my soul Somewhere in this moment, all that I had known, all that I had felt, all that I had experienced, commanded me.
to say, what do you do now? Good evening. Thank you for being with us. My name is Kevin Young. I'm the director of the Schomburg Center for Research and Black Culture. It's my honor tonight to welcome you to the second edition of the Harry Belafonte Black Liberation Speaker Series. The New York Public Library presents this series to honor Harry Belafonte, actor, singer, producer, director, and activist. We are proud to steward the Harry Belafonte archives at the Schomburg Center, bringing him full circle from where he got his start, acting in our American Negro Theater. His archive documents his many achievements, artistic and otherwise, from the 1940s to the present, and includes nearly 300 linear feet of audio and video recordings. This is the second installment of the speaker series, which will continue through the end of this year and into early 2020, all of it generously supported by Kenneth Cole. Tonight's conversation features two debut novelists, Raven Leilani, author of Luster, and Kylie Reed, author of Such a Fun Age, who is a finalist for NYPL's 2020 Young Lions Fiction Award. They'll be speaking with writer and editor, Roxanne Fekier. You can purchase both books from the library shop by going on nypl.org shop, sorry, nypl.org slash shop live. We'll also put a link to it in YouTube and Zoom. Before I invite Raven and Kylie on, a few quick housekeeping items. This event is being recorded, not you, only what you see on screen. If you have questions for either of tonight's speakers, you can send them at any time via Zoom, YouTube, or by emailing publicprograms at nypl.org. They'll answer as many as they can get to toward the end of the program. Real-time captions are available for tonight's program via stream text. The link is in the reminder email you receive for tonight's event, as well as in the chats in Zoom and on YouTube. On Wednesday, December 2nd, the next installment in the Harry Belafonte Black Liberation Speaker Series will feature Brian Washington, winner of the 2020 Young Lions Fiction Award, discussing his debut novel, Memorial. He'll speak with the New Yorker's Vincent Cunningham. You can sign up for it by going to nypl.org slash live. And to stay up to date on all of our events, sign up for our newsletters at nypl.org slash connect. Next, Roxanne Fekir, Raven Leilani, and Kylie Reed. Hi there. Hello. Welcome. I'm so excited to be talking to the both of you. Um, I'm Roxanne, um, and with me I have, as we heard, um, two incredible debut novelists who have had, I mean, we've all had a year, but y'all have had a year in addition to the year that we're all having. Um, so thank you for joining me. I'm so excited to get to speak to you, and I guess we can get right into it. Um, I wanted to, well, first of all, I was lucky enough to have read both of these books already and then got to read them again this past weekend. And I really saw them kind of speaking to each other in ways that I didn't notice the first time around when I had read them separately. Um, so I would ask kind of the both of you, and I guess we can start with you, Kylie. Um, I guess what were some of the original flickers in your mind of like, oh, I think I'm gonna write a story about this. Like what were kind of some of the experiences or snippets or just, yeah, things caught on the wind that kind of ended up, you know, congealing into this novel. And then the same question for you, Raven, afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm so happy to be here with, with both of you. Thank you for, for joining me here. Uh, yes, so I, I don't know if, if Raven is the same. I feel like there is a period where you just think of writing the novel and don't do any other work. It's just in your brain for about a year. And at that time, all I really knew was that I wanted to have a very awkward, precarious dynamic between three people. I find that in reading literature and even just watching movies, like from one of my favorite movies, Moonlight, to, you know, I'm a big rom-com fan, something like, you know, My Best Friend's Wedding, three people just provide this really uneasy balance and allegiances are constantly switching. And I think it's just really rich to observe um, in any type of art. So I knew that I wanted three people. 
And then as I continued to work on it, I got two of those examples. Um, on one level, I got a young woman, her new boyfriend and her employer. And on the other level, I got a young child, her mother and her caretaker. And just that dynamic of domestic work with you know, a, a black woman and a white child and a white mother is so, so rich and in a lot of ways, a very old story. And I think that it's, you know, the technology, the health insurance problems that make it a new story. And so in the beginning, it was just trying to get that page turning feel because that's why I pick up a book. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, I would say, you know, this project, um, it started in like the ashes of a previous book. Um, and I feel like that's sort of important to the beginning of this one because um, what made this different, what made me see this book through was that it felt um, immediately urgent in the way my previous project didn't. Um, so I knew that, um, and I very rarely know much when I'm starting out, it very much is an act of uh, discovery for me. And I often have to write a thing, at least a third to know if it's even going to work on the page. Um, but I knew that I wanted to write uh, a story about um, a young black woman who is trying to carve out time to to create private, meaningful work. Um, and that I think had a real parallel to the life I was living at the time I was writing the book. You know, I was um, working full time and in school full time and trying to write the book and all of my writing had been done in those sort of like uh, after nine to five hours. Um, and so that, frenzy kind of made it onto the page except with the book it's it's painting specifically but I wanted to depict honestly uh what it looks like to try and kind of scrap for time to do work that is meaningful to you while you try to uh, kind of satisfy those survival needs but I also too wanted um I wanted that character to be situated totally in her body uh for like the realities of a human body to be um, to be plain on the page in a way that I think at times can feel ugly, but that to me felt um, honest and and urgent. Yeah. Um, you, Kylie, you spoke a bit about like some of the movies that, you know, the three character structure that kind of, you know, didn't necessarily, you know, end up on the page, but, you know, the structure itself. I wanted to ask kind of both of you, what were some of the stories, books, movies, what were, I mean, and you can also speak to your process writing, like maybe you don't read other books while you write, but maybe just even thinking about it broadly, what were some of the things that you have read or consumed or watched that kind of informed this story as it was coming together on the page or things that inspired you or just kind of sparked another thing that maybe sent you down a different plot point? I mean, like, any, anything and everything for me. I feel that my phone is is such a tool. If I hear someone say something, I immediately write it down. I always email things to me, myself. I was a nanny for six years. This is not a story about me. Amir and I are very different. Uh, but there were so many things that children would say that would just really grab me from a child saying to me, like, you know, make me a grilled cheese or, or whatever it is. And like the way that I feel with it, I just always write it down. Um, I think it was mentioned before, uh, The Perfect Nanny by Leila Samani is such a wonderful book and it presents a murder on the first page and domestic work, which is like two of my favorite things to, to read about. And so also the class dynamics, they were really great, but pretty much a song can inspire me. Honestly, I remember when I was writing this, I was taking soul cycle classes because I was a receptionist at a place like that got free classes. And I remember listening to some of the soul cycle instructors and like their mantras and the copy that like I was just like this is like I'm this is out of control like but you believe it like I'm so inspired yeah. by the culture that like soul cycle has you know what I, like and I wanted to really capture what that looks like in like a philosophy of feminism and a philosophy of like taking care of your child and, and good parenting so I would say yeah movies literature and soul cycle for me yeah <laughs> I would say that I, I mean, I, it is like for me, it's so important to be, um, to be reading and to be watching while I write. Uh, I think that there are definitely some writers I know who like to kind of keep that out of frame. So what they write is pure, but for me, I need to rule. Um, so I, I really love, um, I was reading Mary Gates Girl's Bad Behavior, um, 
I was reading uh, Queenie. Um, I really just, I love anything too that is uh, any kind of dysfunctional marital um, dynamic. I, I'm kind of like really soft for and then wanted to replicate onto the page. So one of the movies that I really love that I think uh, kind of gets that in a way that I, I really enjoy um, is Squid and the Whale. Mm -hmm. um, Noah Baumbach's, uh, I think it's his first film. Um, and I really, really, speaking of music, and I hadn't thought about that until you, until you mentioned that, but I mean, disco was really important to this book, you know, in, in a sort of way that I was listening to it as I was writing, and it's a genre I really enjoy and love deeply, but philosophically too, you know, the idea of, of sort of that unfettered joy um, and too muchness is a thing, a kind of earnestness that I really wanted to channel on the page. Yeah. And then to go from kind of, you know, catching inspiration on the wind and the first, you know, thoughts that kind of came to create these books to put a much finer point on it. I wanted to ask you each about the titles of your books and kind of how they came to be and how they were decided on. Maybe there were other titles at play, but I would love to hear kind of how those titles came to be. Sure. Uh, so I think, I mean, the first title I had for this draft was, you know, because I wrote this in, in workshop, that was, it was usually the thing that I got notes on. It was a horrible, a horrible title. So the title came, the real title came during edits. And I, I went through about like 60 or so before I, I mm. came to this one. And I, uh, when I came to this one, I, I kind of knew that this was going to be the one. So Luster, for me, you know, it, it is kind of punny and that there's lust and desire and there's lust and pain. Um, but um, I wanted to also get at the way that what happens when the fantasy kind of comes up against the flesh and you have to reconcile those two, um, those, those two realities. And uh, the way that luster is kind of uh, both renewed and, and tarnished, and, but also the idea of trying to preserve yourself um, and preserve your, you know, your faith in, in your art um, in a, a kind of a brutal uh, set of circumstances, um, what that means to maintain, you know, uh, your faith and your, your luster um, in the midst of real severe precarity. Uh, yes, I did not have a title for, I think the two and a half years then I was writing it. And then at the end, you have to put a name on it when you want to try and sell the thing. And so uh, the I had always the same thing, been collecting names in my phone, but had not really uh, stuck with anything. But the thing that I liked about such a fun age was immediately it put me in that child space. It's just like, it, it's almost like a asking about the weather when you're with a child at a playground. You say, oh, how old is she? Oh, she's 15. Oh, it's such a fun age. Yeah, it's just like this weird thing between strangers that puts you, I liked that it put you in the child space and the like, this is not someone that you talk to all the time. Like this is not normal language. Um, but also Amira is at a very precarious age at 25. She's not having a ton of fun. She feels like she's left behind. Um, but also I wanted to comment on the age that she's living in. It's in 2015. And I think, you know, so many recent events have, have made us think often to romanticize the years before current <laughs> dictatorships and thinking, you know, oh, things were so much better back then. But that 2015 was, was when, you know, Black Lives Matter was being, you know, well, very well known in response to brutal police brutality. And, you know, there's so many people who pick up black art and say, oh, this is really timely. But I don't really think that it's more timely than in the 1950s when most women had to be domestic workers as well. And so I'm definitely commenting on the age um, and I like the accessibility of the title um, yeah. and everyone else on the team liked it too. Yeah. yeah. Um, so some of the, some of the, you know, threads that I was kind of seeing linking your books together. I mean, there are a lot, but it was, you know, very tightly wound stories of Black women kind of coming up in a very real face-to-face -face way with whiteness in a broad sense. Um, but what I've loved so much about reading your books and so many other um, Black novelist books in recent years is that there's like a specificity to the Blackness. Like it's not just a Black girl who's dealing with Black girl struggles. It's like this Black girl is West Indian and like there's like 
the realities of what that means. And this black girl is um, Nigerian and this black girl is Ghanaian or this person is um, African-American and here's where her people are from. So I wanted to kind of speak to you about the specificity of your main characters and kind of what that meant and how it informed kind of how they move through the world or why you maybe chose one um, heritage versus another and kind of speak to that. Um, yeah, I, I, I would say that uh, with, with Edie as a character, I, there are parts of her like lineage that I, I even like kind of lifted from my own life. You know, she is a uh, West Indian girl. And um, I had, I think, a uh, couple years ago, I, I have an uncle who has kind of done all of our genealogy, and I have found out that um, uh, my grandfather came over from Trinidad and Tobago on a ship called Narissa, which literally means raven hair. Mm. And so I kind of lifted some of that. Um, I thought it was important to kind of imbue her story with those familial roots more because, you know, I think you present a character, you find her, you arrive to her at 23 years old and uh, she is a person who is making a lot of sort of uh, dysfunctional choices that are like born by her id. But I thought that that um, was necessary to be like contextualized within uh, where she comes from. And I thought, you know, it was important to, to kind of have those where her father comes from, where her mother comes from and the way that they interact with their blackness and the way that has bearing on the way that she interacts with hers. Um, but uh, I mean, I think the most um, apparent way that we kind of see her interacting with her blackness is this hypervigilance that she has as she moves through space and, and the way that she um, is kind of depersonalized and like outside of her body as she calculates um, like the most palatable form to project. And that kind of precludes a uh, real genuine connection um, and, and distorts her in the way that when she comes to the canvas, uh, she can't really replicate her reality or her face in any real way. So I think, um, you know, there's also Akila too. And I wanted their, you know, I wanted their blacknesses <laughs> to, be, um, to be highly specific and for there to be even at times tension um, between the way that they, uh, the way that they've cobbled together that identity. Um, so it was important for me to have like Edie as a young adult um, uh, kind of dealing with that in the professional and romantic realms and also have a child who is trying to figure out what her blackness and her womanhood means um, in a space that cannot really adequately witness her um, and, uh, yeah, I wanted to have a couple shades uh, yeah. and I wanted still to have them relate to each other and have there be kinship between them. I'm also thinking of Aria as well and yeah. how they kind of come up against each other in very direct ways, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was super interesting. Uh, for Amira, there were a lot of things that I wanted to accomplish in terms of why she is the way she is and what her blackness does in the spaces that she's in. And I think from the very beginning, um, this episode in the grocery store where Amira is racially profiled, um, it's such a familiar scene, um, but I think that even in, an, in sometimes black people's only attempt to get justice, which is pulling out their cell phone and, and revealing something, I think that harmful things can come from it as well. And so on one level, I wanted to tell a really gripping story where you put yourself in that position and you think, what would I do? On the other end, I did want to show some of these holes and, and how that they can function in terms of what Blackness is seen from someone's, tel from someone's cell phone. And so I feel like what happens often is in these viral videos, there is a Black woman who is ready. She's had it and she's like, not today. I have time today. Let me tell you, like, this is not going to happen. And it's a it's an example of cartoon racism where it's someone saying the N-word, it's a person going off in a way that is so they're clearly unhinged and it's a very easy black and white situation. And so I couldn't help but think it's something that brought me to Amira is that, you know, not all 
black women every day are ready for that. Not all black women are amazing communicators at every moment of the day. You know, me, myself, I'm not a like, let me tell you right now, I'm like an awkward two days later, like, hey, remember that thing? Can we, can we go back to that conversation? You know, because we are human and we are all different. And so I wanted to have an example of a young black woman who isn't the best communicator right away, who also thinks like, wait a second, like what is going on? And, and doesn't give the viewer that satisfactory feeling that I think often gets put on black women and how they respond in the future. Um, but also Amira has a really interesting upbringing. She was raised in a community with a very high deaf population. It's also a lower income neighborhood where she's not answering to people in certain ways and they are not expecting certain things from her um, in terms of how to act or how she speaks or, or anything else. Um, it was really important for me to make it very clear that Amira is a dark skinned woman and how that looks next to a white child. Um, I think that a lot of people like to run from that a little bit because of colorism and the way that that works. And, and that's not what I wanted to do here. And um, there were so many things I wanted to, you know, just give her an honor in her and that she's an amazing babysitter. She doesn't have a lot of like artistic passion that she wants to do, but in order for her to get health insurance, it's my belief that she shouldn't have to. She should, you know, if she has a DUI from last year or if she got fired from her last job, she still deserves all of the things that, you know, the white characters there have. And so I also wanted to honor her in this way of, you know, there's a moment where Amira gets a bonus, she gets $1,200. And she says, like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a leather jacket. Like, that's what I'm gonna do <laughs> right now. Um, and I think that we often see a lot of black characters in literature making these absolute perfect choices so that the reader can then really, really be behind them. But I wanted Amira to be a human. And I think we've all bought something at one point when we know we should have saved, yeah. Absolutely. Um, uh, I wanted to talk about the specific relationships between black women and white women in both of your novels. Um, I think uh, broadly, we could say that each of those characters are in an uneasy kind of detente with each other, to put it lightly. Um, and I know how I felt reading those um, accounts. Like I was kind of like, I can't believe that I'm seeing this on the page. Like there's such specificity and um, like a tangible realness for me in, in terms of interactions that I've had. Um, but I wanted to kind of speak to you about what it was like or what, how you kind of distilled those types of interactions to put a specific one on the page. And also um, to speak to that uneasy detente between black women and white women, because let's be real, it's, it's playing out in real time across this country. Um, what reactions have been like from differing audiences to some of those moments or how they were depicted or you know, what they think the character is like beyond what was on the page, right? Like, oh, but she's not a bad person or maybe this. So broad question, but kind of like, how did those um, interactions come to be on the page? And also what has the response been like specifically from those two audiences? Um. Well, I mean, I really, I wanted to be uh, rigorous in, in that depiction in that both characters were allowed to have dimension and humanity. Because I think to have um, erected like one character as like overtly villainous um, that, I mean, I actually think that a lot of readers would feel kind of manipulated by that. But I also thought that would be a, um, a too clean and extremely reduced idea of, of the reality of that. So I wanted first for both of the characters to be infallible and to have needs and wants, but I wanted to be um, I wanted to be rigorous in the way that their relationship is kind of, is predicated on a very clear power imbalance and, and in fact is like really kind of overtly transactional. Um, and the way that has bearing on uh, the way, the kind of latitude that Edie has to um, make mistakes in that borrowed space um, and or even leave that, that borrowed space. Um, and the way that their kind of different experiences um, kind of stoke a conspiracy between them, but also a real, um, a real chasm that I think 
the burden is often on on Edie to kind of try and close. I, I really loved Kylie what you're talking about about like the the kind of representation of those infractions in black and white and the way that that is not necessarily truthful to the reality of it and what it looks like um, in real life and on the page to have a character processing that as it's happening and to allow that character um, uh, humanity in kind of not being able to process it perfectly or respond perfectly. And so in, in my book, one of the ways, like one of the more kind of um, like over ways that manifests is that at one point Edie tries to explain to Rebecca this thing that she's seen that she knows is, is racist in, and what that feels like to try and articulate a thing that is uh, a thing that is small and a thing that is because it's small, uh, easy to diminish. Um, and what it means to trust your own eyes in a world that is is constantly trying to, um, I don't know, kind of neutralize uh, your reality and make it okay. Uh, and so in that, in that moment, I really felt it was, I felt it was necessary to show, uh, you know, Edie really struggling with how to even articulate you know, the way the kind of like gray, sh the shades of gray that are, that are kind of representative, I think of like the majority of kind of aggressions that we, that we feel and deal with in private um, and deal with belatedly when we actually know how to react. Um, uh, so for me, it was, um, it was putting those, those things forward um, and not trying, not shying away from, um, that conflict, um, but also allowing space for characters and people to do what they do, which is to kind of skirt around the thing and let that thing grow bigger. Um, and so, yeah, I think that is sort of one way that I try to tackle it. Yeah, uh, I think I get a little bit clinical when I am attacking the accuracy of, of being black in a, in a white space. And it's not that I don't care about my characters, but I am so obsessed with getting that dialogue exactly how it happens. And as I listen and as I gather research, it, so much of the language is compliments. It's, I'm just making sure, I just wanna apologize. And I'm just doing this for you. And I, I just really wanted to nail that when it comes to these dynamics and you know, big differences between two women with class and, and status, that a lot of it is making a joke and making sure that you know how much I appreciate you and, and all of those things. And I feel like that takes up so much uh, real estate that I did want to honor it without obviously without it being boring as well. Um, I wanted to establish that, you know, Amira is wondering what's going to happen next in her life. And Alex is constantly thinking about Amira in a way that Amira is just not thinking about her. And I don't think that Alex understands that like for Amira, like, I, I know you, <laughs> like I don't need to get to know you that much better. And I, I'm gonna butcher the James Baldwin quote when he talks about like, you wanna know about me, but like I'm in your world. Like I know everything about you. Like I know what you do on dates. I know who's supposed to pay. Like I know about your world. So like, I just don't really need to ask. And also I'm broke, <laughs> so like, I just don't care. Um, and so I just really wanted to make sure that Amir is, you know, disinterest and Alex's desperation to be seen in her eyes a different way was, was really working against each other. And yeah, I've, I've had so many interesting reactions. Uh, and you know, I, hot take, I fully believe that you cannot, you know, choose the way that people approach your art. You know, I just feel that that is what it is. And so if someone loves it, if someone doesn't like it, like that is great that they, you know, interacted with it. Um, I remember like in the very first month of before my book came out, I think someone, like, I think it was like maybe like some bookstore posted something about my book and I was so excited. And someone immediately commented, I don't read Negro novels. Oh, and I okay. was like, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna have to grow up in this in a way that I shouldn't have to. And I'm going to approach people's comments differently. And so now, I mean, it's a terrible comment that sets me up to like, if you are excited, if, you, if you're not, I'm just excited that you came at my mm -hmm. book with an with you know that you realize it's a book that you should read and so the comments from you know I have to I'm so thankful that so many people have really related to the book and that just makes me as an artist feel like okay I'm not crazy like other people are obsessed with the same things that I'm obsessed with but it's been interesting to have 
white women say to me constantly like, oh my God, this woman was so, she was crazy. She's such a monster. She's psychotic. And like, honestly, Alex, not that bad. If you're a low income person trying to work, someone doesn't mess with your coin. She's not that bad. She is sneaky and she makes a lot of bad decisions, but as an employer, just not that bad in, in who she is until, until she makes some really poor decisions. Um, and it's been interesting, you know, because for every white woman who said that, there's a black woman who goes, oh, I know this woman. Oh yeah, I sit next to her. I do carpool with her. I know this woman and I feel bad for her. And I just think it's a really interesting thing to watch a lot of black women have this empathy for her and see her as this lonely person. And I, I think that, you know, I could probably write a terrible thesis on it about how black women see someone as part of a system and not always as, as just this one evil person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about the children in each of your novels and um, some of you might've mentioned it a little bit, but kind of um, grounding yourself in those child characters and getting those voices down on the page and kind of what that was like. Um, yeah, I'll leave it that open-ended. Just there really of... are some good similarities. Like, why did I like not think <laughs> of that when I was reading it? I was like, these are, yeah, was a good match. Okay. Uh, yeah, like I said, I was a nanny for a long time and I, I worked at a children's uh, birthday party studio where I sometimes did like six to seven birthday parties a week. Um, so I witnessed a lot of children and I, I really like children. Um, I was just babysitting constantly since I was little. And so nailing the ch Briar's voice it was so important to me because I feel that children are often used as a literary device where a child reveals a secret at a perfect point, or they're just like, you know, explaining exactly, like they're like just the exposition body or something, or like asking a perfect question. And I really didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I also think children are really funny. And so the way that I wanted to deploy Briar's humor was really specific because I, I interview a lot of people when I'm writing, it really helps me. And I would interview moms and I would say, you know, what's the funniest thing that your child has ever said? And I understand the instinct, but a lot of moms would say, oh, well, you know, uh, you know, Dustin says, oh, mommy, I hate Trump. And it's like, he didn't just like, <laughs> like, let's be real. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? And like, that's fine. He can say that. And I understand like why well, that's funny to you. But I think that children coming to their own realizations about the world is so funny. And I, I really wanted everything that Briar said to be something that she realized on her own, that she's not mimicking anyone. She's not trying to get attention in that moment. She's just dealing with her own thoughts. And so sometimes for Briar, it's, you know, mom, some fish don't have fins. And that's just the way they are. And that's just her coming to understand that as she says that. And so it was really important for me just to have her be an odd, awkward, funny child on her own um, and not try and use her as a prop. Yeah. I definitely felt that um, pressure slash responsibility to, to have Akila be something more than a, a prop. You know, I, I definitely felt that, especially yeah. in terms of representing a, a more like a kind of young adult um, there is the uh, kind of archetype of a wise and child that I felt like I really wanted to um, complicate, you know, and she is, uh, she's, perhaps she's, she's a bit wise and because she has, you know, been through a few homes and is older kind of psychologically than, than she should be um, at that age. Um, but for me, writing her character was her kind of primary need is stability. You know, she's trying to preserve that in the midst of a kind of deeply unstable environment, um, you know, even setting aside like her kind of invisibility. Um, the idea of Edie kind of coming into the house and becoming a part of that household is initially a threat to her. And so the way that they relate, uh, it had to be complicated. It, it had to be complicated also because I, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to develop a real relationship between um two you know young black women who are very two very different stages of development um and uh with Akila, you know she it was important for me that she uh, even though she is wizened uh that, that there'd be things that she doesn't know and there was plenty that she doesn't know because her 
um, her caregivers do not have the kind of lived experience um, to give her, to kind of give her the, the tutelage that is necessary to move through the world safely. Um, but it, it was too important that her childhood, you know, be, have corners of joy. You know, so I made her a nerd, you know, and I mean, I've, there's a, there's my own bias in there. Um, I gave her a lot of my, uh, a lot of my own loves, um, but I, I did want her to have uh, something beside that kind of desperate um, preservation of stability or surly teenagehood. You know, I wanted her to have, a, you know, some kind of thing that she was earnestly, you know, engaged with. And for me, that I mean, that was fandom for her. So I wanted to depict her girlhood um, as one that is is coming together through this through this love, um, this love that she is kind of fiercely protecting, um, and which she slowly lets Edie in on um, as they kind of get to know each other. Those like digital interfaces, but but also the idea of the things that she doesn't know, um, uh, which. I was able to have Edie kind of give her that knowledge. Um, and those moments where, uh, for instance, when, uh, you know, she does Akilah's hair or helps her, you know, figure out how to care for that, for her hair, um, that felt, for me, and I think a lot of us, those were really deeply formative moments. Um, and so I wanted that level of specificity um, in depicting, you know, what her, what her kind of new womanhood um, is looking like. Yeah. I don't know if this will come up on screen, but just speaking to like how I was seeing the similarities between both of your books, oh I like God, did I like a little it. like, <gasps> so like you have like Amira who's all up in this family, like she like touches all four of them. And then you have, you have Edie, who's all up in this, like it's like the shapes even kind of replicate each other. <laughs> like I was like, this is crazy. Like the way that these things are coming together. So good. <laughs> I feel like that's like so much of what I do love to write about. And I think that like, it's such an, ex it's such a very universal experience for a lot of black women feeling like I'm here. And then when I go to work or when I like meet this, like I'm in this other area over here and, mm -hmm. and I'm a different person in both. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it just, it's just too interesting to not write yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you both about um, this year, as I said at the beginning, we've all had a year, but you have been navigating um, debut novels and the whole like release cycle and all that. So I kind of wanted to just touch on and ask you both what it's been like to, you know, be receiving well-deserved accolades, but kind of be doing it as we're doing this, like kind of from the confines of your home or over the phone or what that's been like, how's it felt? Maybe you're good with it. Maybe you didn't really want to be out there shaking a bunch of hands <laughs> and it's worked out. Just kind of how has this year kind of unfolded, um, I guess, in, in, contrast to what one might think a debut novel, a, a smash debut novel, a novelist year would go. Yeah, uh, I, my book came out on New Year's Eve of last year. And so I did get to do about four weeks of tour and we did about 19 cities in January. And I was so nervous. I did not know how that experience was going to be, but it was so touching in a way that really bowled me over. Like, I did not think it was going to be this like emotional thing or, you know, I in Savannah, this young black woman came up to the table and she just burst into tears. And I was like, are you okay? She was like, of course I'm not, I'm 25, I'm miserable. I love your book, it's like, oh, okay. Which is like, I, I get it. So there were moments like that that just unfortunately can't happen online. And there were also like really sweet community things that I would see. Like I did not know about the Bookstagram community before of doing a book. And then I saw that people from Bookstagram who don't know each other, like meet up in cities, like, and then and I just, I don't like just to meet up over a book to meet strangers that way. It's just really, really sweet. And so I, it was extremely sad to cancel the second leg of my tour at the same time, safety is first. And the fact that I get to still do this is just the biggest fortunate thing in my life. And so, so many, you know, authors have had their entire thing from a computer. And so the fact that I got a little tiny taste of it, I just feel grateful. Um, and I'll stay inside as long as I need to, because I'm a writer and I'm fine. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm one of those writers who has like entirely done everything uh, through a computer. And for me, it kind of is like a gentle on-ramp to, uh, to this life. Um, it's slightly less nerve-wracking, but at the same time, um, you know, because this is my first time around, so I don't really have anything to compare it to. This is how it, how it is for me. Um, but I do, what I like about this is like this, like literally right now looking at, and I hope this doesn't sound sad, right? But like, but looking at my screen, it feels like, it feels like it, there's a different kind of intimacy that even when I'm attending an event, I feel like I'm kind of looking in on the conversation. It feels like vaguely voyeuristic, but in a good way, you know? And I, I like, I kind of like um, the kind of mobility uh, we have in this format where perhaps if I couldn't make it you know, across the country to X place, I could still kind of pop in. Um, yeah. But the, the response um, has been, uh, has really surpassed my expectations, especially considering um, like the, the kind of climate that has necessitated this, you know, this format. Um, it has been, um, I, I just feel in general, we're really fortunate that um, people who want to engage with my book and uh, are still doing it, even though we don't have those sort of traditional um, modes of, of meeting up. Um, I think like I had a, um, gosh, I, I had like a kind of a, an event that was sort of a pre-pub thing in Philly before this all happened. It was the very first panel I'd ever done. Um, and like I stayed up all night just like practicing my notes because it was, it was very nerve wracking. Um, and that, that experience was, um, I think the adrenaline is part of it. It was kind of magic uh, because of that. So I am, you know, I am looking forward to whatever point in time I'm, we can actually see each other and be in the same room. Um, but for now, I, I'm, I'm kind of still just a bit taken aback and grateful for the response to the, the work. Yeah. What are you both reading and working on now? Um, I am... I am working on like some short stories currently. It's been harder for me to write, I should be honest. I've, I've mostly been able to paint since the pandemic started. So I've been doing a lot of that, um, uh, but it's, it is nice when I can to return to the page. Um, I don't really know, like I'm new to this, but like if I'm allowed to, but I'm reading Morgan Jerkins' new thing and it'll be out soon and I will mm -hmm. love it. Yeah, very cool. <laughs> Um, yeah, whenever I, I ask writers what they're reading, it's always like ARCs, and I'm like, uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> in, a, in a year, I'm like, I'm get that. <laughs> yes, um, this year I'm trying to read more plays, mm. and I just got my hands on Slave Play, which I have not read, which I'm interested in reading. Um, also, Annie Baker is one of my favorite playwrights. Um, she wrote The Flick, which I, I love a lot. And I have her other copy called John on my nightstand. Um, and so I'm working on another novel. And as as sad as I, I was to cancel a lot of tour, like being at home is like my happy writing place. So I, I like know I would not be as far along <laughs> as I am if I wasn't <laughs> staying at home. So yes, novel number two is on the way. Very cool. Um, I think it might be about time to get into audience q and A's. so I'll read off um, what we've got so far. Um, question one, I'd love to hear both authors talk about how they approached revisions and rewrites, particularly as their books were coming into publication amidst a big movement for Black Lives. Did they find their work shaped by current events as they were writing it? And I'd also love to know more about how they approached building the villains in their stories. In both Luster and Such a Fun Age, there's no one clear villain, although in the latter one does emerge by the end, I think. How did they build up the negative forces in their characters' lives without pegging them to one person? Um, I mean, I think, I mean, as I wrote, I, I, I very much kind of block everything out. Like on the page, I, I'm not, um, I feel like I'm not receiving any sort of outside feedback and it's kind of the only way I can write uh, with any real freedom. Um, so coming to the page, I, I'm, my main goal was to depict um, candidly, like the, the consciousness of, of a black woman who is, um, who is hungry and 
uh, kind of desperate um, in seeking connection in her art. Um, and I think we, we released it into a climate where um, there are real strong parallels naturally um, with what she kind of goes through um, uh, in the book. Um, and I think kind of naturally so, because it was important to me to be, um, to, to write rigorously about that artistic journey, but also the way that inter intersects with her blackness and the way that her body um, is sort of imperiled in the public realm. And uh, that, you know, when the book came out, um, I began to have those conversations about uh, where the kind of roots of that were. And for me, it, it was just sort of a, like a natural kind of byproduct of trying to tell that unvarnished story um, of, of how she moves through space. Um, so I, I, think, I think I might've forgotten like the second half of the question. The second um, half is about um, how do you approach building the villains in oh. the story? Because there are no, you know, how do you build up the negative things that they're doing while not making them, I guess, one note sure. villains? I mean, I think, I mean, I think the best villains are the villains where you, um, you understand where they're coming from in some way, right? Like, I do think that uh, to have a villain be one note, um, to have them sort of be um, overtly awful, there is no room, at, you know, to, there's no kind of where to go from there, uh, rather than like a kind of grand statement uh, about their kind of their villain. So I, I wanted it to be complex. Uh, I wanted it to be complex for Edie as she kind of, uh, you know, navigates these relationships. Um, that just felt more, I don't know, that felt more, that felt more human and that felt more honest. Uh, and that is sort of my, what always guides me as I write, which is how to, how to represent the, like the most, um, I don't know, the most unvarnished version of the thing, the version that allows people to be fallible. Um, and I think that fallibility you know, that, that too is kind of like short for, for villainy. Yeah. yeah uh, I'll start with revision, such a big part of the process. Um, I, I like to follow my instinct until I get to a point where I'm like, what am I doing? I need someone to help me here. And so I gave the first 50 pages to a, a friend and, and someone I look up to, and he said, start over. And I think that the way that he did it, which was kind but firm and also you know there's a woman in a grocery store uh who accuses amira of kidnapping and the version one of that woman was like this crazy woman who was like you stole that baby and just him pulling me back and saying like what's more insidious is someone doing you know trappings of white supremacy by saying i just want to make sure she's safe i'm just nervous for her i'm a mom like all of those things are so much more insidious and i think that that kind of set the tone for the rest of the novel. So I was so, so grateful for that revision. And then I wrote a lot before I went to grad school. And then I was in the novel workshop in my first year uh, with Paul Harding, who's wonderful. And I learned so much from him. And then I gave my classmates 180 pages, I believe. And workshops are such a mixed bag. You never know what you're gonna get, but this was just like such a wonderful workshop where the work we were covering was so diverse that I think it allowed us to really meet everyone's work on its terms. There was like a horror, like mega church thriller. There was a slave novel. There was like a weird cowboy novel with John Wayne and who comes back from the, it was just like our brains were stretched in so many ways that I felt like the revisions my classmates gave me were so wonderful. And I probably used like 85% of them. So I really do believe in the revision process. And of course there's more with my agent and my editor who are both brilliant women that just making this book as, as wonderful as we could do. Um, and as far as the second one, oh wait, no, I wanna go to the first one too, because yes, Raven was saying things I, that I was relating to as well. Um, and writing books like this that, you know, when people read them, they say, oh, it's so current. This is, you know, how do current events affect your writing it? I think one is as black women, 
these events don't seem as timely, I think, often. I think it's like, okay, when's the next one? Oh, there it is a little bit from, from the time of when you're born. And I think that rather than current events affecting the way I write it, I think I've noticed more that current events affect the way that people read a book like this. And I, I understand that people often feel lost and they don't know what to do. And they're like, I'm going to buy black art to like participate, which is wonderful because there's so much great black art. Um, but I think that then they pick up the book as a pedagogical tool rather than a story. And I think that that's not giving, you know, honor to, to the read. I had a, a white woman message me saying, you know what, like I'm here to work, I'm here to learn. I started reading her book. And on the first page, I saw that the white woman had divider plates for her child. And I have those plates, I threw them away. I was like, what? You can't throw your plates away. What are you doing? <laughs> So it's like, I don't know what you're trying to learn from here. Like I, I am a teacher. I'll be teaching at Temple University next semester. But when I'm writing, I'm a storyteller. I never pick up a pen saying, I'm going to teach people something. I'm going to make them feel bad. I want to help them do the work. I'm just, I'm just truly obsessed with storytelling. And so it's been interesting to see how current events um, drive people to books uh, for, for not, you know, specifically what they were written for. Yeah. Um, and yeah. With characters like Alix, I when I teach, I tell my student, you have to give every character a win. You have to show when they're really good at their job, how they're a really good friend, how you know maybe they have really good handwriting, or maybe they offer someone a ride to the airport or whatever it is. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know the event that happens to Amira, Alex could have handled it a bunch of different ways. She gives Amira twelve hundred dollars, and I can say when I was a nanny, I would have been like, "This is awesome! Like that's a great reaction. I don't want to talk about it. Give me money and let's move on from that." Um, so she does have some ways that she she nails it. The same thing with Kelly. At sometimes he really nails it, and sometimes he really messes up. And I just really wanted the reader to kind of date both of these people and see, okay, how much can I bend and shift with, with their actions? Yeah. Um, our next question is, how has your interior life evolved since you completed this book? What about since they've hit so hard? And hit is in all caps, and that is factual. <laughs> these books have hit. <laughs> um, oh, man, that's a hard one. Um, I. I feel so, so grateful. That's so trite to say, but I feel really grateful and I feel more like, like I like a challenge and I feel more of like, okay, everyone who read my book and liked the cringiness of it will expect that from me in another book. So I'm really excited to go harder with that. I really like that challenge. Um, but in certain ways, it's really humbling getting back to work because my book has been, I've gone over it so, so many times. And when I read it, I feel really great about it. And then now when I go to my second novel and I write something, I'm like, oh, this is trash. Like, welcome back. <laughs> like, it's, just, it's not <laughs> polished. And it's just like, you're, you're right back to where I think, but I have to say it's writing. That's one of those things like that I love about writing is it, it just, it's an equalizer. You have to work at it and you just have to bring your hand gently back to the page over and over again. Um, and no, you know, no matter how hard your book hits, when you go back, you have to hit it even harder. So it's a nice humbling effect. I feel that so, so much, you know, <laughs> returning to the page yeah. and, and remembering the way that it is hard. And for me, you know, I, I really, that was how I knew that I wanted to write was when it was hard, it was still something I loved, but it is still, um, it is still very much uh, a process and having uh, people engage generously with the work has, has made me feel um, held. It, it has, it has made me feel encouraged and uh, affirmed um, in that I could kind of put all of my, uh, you know, all of my obsessions into a book and have, the, you know, the obsessions that kind of felt private and felt specific and felt, um, I don't know, felt unique to me, you know, even though, I mean, what is, but I felt really um, like a real kind of sense of like communion and all of these words are so crunchy, but, you know, I've, I really felt that, uh, that affirmation of that part of myself that for a, a long time was um, 
kept in the dark and kind of a deeply solitary thing and that feels really wonderful but it is like it is just like constantly a process you know it is i'm i still feel um really capable of writing something horrible and that is I, that is that is truly humbling and I, I miss that part about revision but it is important you know that that is where the that's where the writing gets done um, and you know I feel having gone through the process before, you know one time now um, I do feel like kind of different patience with it uh, with the kind of amount of time it takes to get to the finish line and uh, you know the amount of eyes and hands that are that are really necessary in the process to make it a thing that um that cleans next up we have um please address how the instances of intrusion of privacy are so normal in both books mm -hmm. why is this normal <laughs> well i mean i i really that's just that's i think a result of one of my kind of things that I love in art, which is uh, the feeling that I am a warrior. Like I really love that sensation of, of looking in on a moment that is unstudied um, and that I, I maybe shouldn't be seeing. And so I wanted to, I desperately wanted to replicate that on the page. Um, and it, it helped that, you know, Edie is a painter um, and kind of has to be studious because of that that discipline, um, but for me that, I, I really just am invested in that. I, I can't remember who actually, who actually said this or wrote this, but the idea of the magnetism of a thing that you can see but are standing outside of is, is a thing that I really am drawn to and am constantly trying to replicate. Yeah, uh, any, I'm, I'm very obsessed with with notions of privacy and what privacy does with a cell phone, what privacy does with like putting your children on your Instagram, what consent means, what, you know, black women look like on, you know, when you see them on a cell phone versus in real life and, and how they have to deal with that. Um, you know, so many people said to me on tour, like, oh my gosh, when she was looking at her text messages, I was going crazy. Blah, blah, blah. And like, listen, I get it. She shouldn't do that. At the same time, when I lived in New York City, or even now, I'm on, when I used to go on the train in Philadelphia, if someone, if a stranger is next to me and they're sending a text, I don't know that I want to look. I just like, we're nosy. We just want to know things about people. And I have to say like so many, like those little things that I hear, like end up inspiring me. And you just want to know what's going on around you. But of course, when you have that employer employee barrier, you have to respect it. And so Alex's little creeping in is not respecting Amir's privacy. And like she gets closer and closer to treating, you know, her private things as if they're hers. And, and the idea of consent kind of gets thrown out the window. And so, I'm, I'm very obsessed with, with how privacy works on phones. I cannot wait to see like a documentary of like, you know, 18 year olds that have like been on the internet since they were born. Like that's something we still don't know like what that does to someone yet. Um, and so, yeah, I think I'll continue to write about privacy. I think it's very interesting. Um, I could do a real quick one. Um, thank you so much for this talk. How do you fight, if at all, the urge to put more of your own lived experiences into your protagonist stories? Oh, man. I don't fight it. I, I think. Was, <laughs> I was going to say, wait a second. <laughs> very much. If, if it's there and it, and the, the data feels right to lift, I, I will put it in there. You know, I, I, the last time, like my, my family has been texting me <laughs> a lot <laughs> um, after this book came out. They, they recognize some kind of, uh, you know, they recognize some similarities. And, and that's all good. I mean, that's all good <laughs> um, with, with, with them. But I do, I really just, I kind of don't, um, you know, it's fiction. I, I, I want to be, be clear on that and that it's a thing that I have crafted and, and sketched out and, and really wrote intentionally. But if it's there to access, I take it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anything that's happening to you and you want to write, I think, everything is 
full on the table. Um, I personally don't usually write about personal events in my life, just probably because nothing exciting is happening to me. But I like the thing I'm writing right now, I feel myself sometimes with a certain character who is not me when it comes to her humor, I feel myself going into it. And I have a really wonderful friend and reader who was like, oh, this sounds too much like you, you gotta pull it back. I just rely on my readers to keep the characters true um, and really make sure that I'm giving them their own personalities. Um, even if I think I'm hilarious at some point, I gotta pull it back. <laughs> yeah. Well, on that note, we are just hitting our time. I want to thank you so much for talking to me. It's been, I was so excited in the days leading up to this, just being able to be in conversation with you both and talk about these books that I love so much. Um, thank you to everybody who attended tonight and asked thoughtful questions. And yeah, there's a link in the chat for a survey about tonight's event. And yeah, everybody, if you haven't read these books, read them. Um, if you're not gonna take it out from your library, buy it from an indie seller. And on that note, good night, everybody. Thank you so much, ladies. This was really lovely. This was wonderful. Have a good night. Good night. Black text on white background, New York Public Library Lion logo, 125 years. Learn more about the New York Public Library nypl.org.